In the images that I showed you in the last lecture, some of the most intriguing things that you could see were things that were noticed in the very earliest images were these small spherical things that were immediately called blueberries. They were called blueberries because they look blue in the false color that's used. They're not really blue. But let's take a look at some of those pictures again. Here they are, as you'll remember, in the upper parts. This is where those wavy forms were that looked like they were formed in damp regions. Damp stuff in through here. And blueberries, 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 blueberries everywhere. What are these things? Well, there were a couple experiments on these rovers that were designed to be able to measure compositions of small scale things. One of them was a miniature version of the thermal emission spectrometer, mini tests, in fact it was called. And the problem is that mini tests, when it looked at a field, it looked at a pretty big swath. And so if you really wanted to know what the blueberries were and you looked like this, You'd be getting some of the spectra of the blueberries, but some of it of this stuff. You could look here. It's very difficult to isolate the blueberries, except that there was this one nice location where the blueberries did a good job of isolating themselves. This region came to be known, not surprisingly, as the berry bowl. And what happened was that a spectrum, a thermal emission spectrum, was taken right here, and another thermal emission spectrum was taken right here, and the two were compared. And it's great because you have the same background rock in both locations, and the only difference is blueberries. And what are the blueberries? Hematite. These are the main source of all that hematite that was seen from space, these funny looking nodules that are strewn all around the crater. In the images that you see here, they're in that upper unit of the stratigraphy. But if you look back, at, at least at the stratigraphic column that we looked at last time, you see that they're everywhere. They are the hematitic concretions something, something, something. Those little black dots, the little black dots are down here in the lower unit, they're in the middle unit, and they're in the upper unit too. They are infusing this entire region in through here. What are they? Well, it's hard to know when you just see these little blueberries. Little blueberries could be things that uh, came in from above, maybe an impact happens, these things get strewn all over the place, they land all over the place, they could have been formed there. How do you know? One of the nice ways in which this was figured out was by looking in detail with a microscopic imager, a little, little, almost like a little handheld lens, and looking at some of the blueberries in place. And there are many examples of this sort of image where you can see this, but this is one that I want to show you where you can see that this is a region that's, that's laminated. It has layers going across here in the small scale picture. You can't see them as much. And here's a layer going across here like that. And if you look very carefully, the layers continue through the blueberry itself parallel to the layers on the outside. This happens over and over again, and this would not happen unless these blueberries were formed inside of these layers. These blueberries, and they're, they're hematite, these blueberries are now thought to be what are called concretions. Concretions are things that form when water is flowing through this unit and a small bit of uh, hematite will precipitate out and it will grow rings of, of hematite around it. And in fact, there are some blueberries that have been broken open and you can see inside almost like tree rings on the inside as these concretions have grown. So they're everywhere. They're not just up in this upper layer that was thought to form with, in a damp environment. They're in the very dry environments down here of the dunes. They're in the semi-moist environments up here of the sand sheet. They're everywhere through there. Why are there blueberries throughout? It's because they were formed not at the time that these layers were put down, but they are formed after the fact as the water level rises up through here, precipitates out these blueberries uh, throughout the entire column. So these are much later than these initial dunes. If you had come back when there were dunes on the surface, you would have found no blueberries. But again, an indication of this water table rising and lowering through this region. What else do we know about the chemistry and the mineralogy of this region? There was yet another instrument on board the rover called a Mossbauer spectrograph. The way a Mossbauer spectrograph works is it puts, there's a rock right here, it puts the unit right up next to the rock. So this is on the robotic arm of the rover. It puts the unit right up next to the rock and it sends gamma rays into the rock. Gamma rays, once again, very useful things. And those gamma rays interact with the nuclei that are there inside. Every type of nucleus will absorb and re-emit different types of gamma rays, and this particular Mossbauer spectrograph was tuned to send out gamma rays that are absorbed and emitted by iron. And taking that iron and putting it in different minerals slightly changes the energies of the gamma rays that are absorbed and emitted. And so 
the way the Mossbauer spectrograph works is the energy level of the gamma rays being emitted is scanned over a, a range and the gamma rays coming back are examined to see which gamma rays come back because they were absorbed and re-emitted versus just passing on through the rock. From this you can tell not just that there's iron there, but you can tell every little flavor of iron that there might be, what kind of mineral that iron is in. The way you do that, of course, is you take your Mossbauer spectrograph on the Earth and you do the same thing on known minerals on the Earth and you can identify them. So what does it look like when you do this? Here's some of the first data back from the Mossbauer spectrograph and let's, let's look to how it works. This is, on this axis is velocity. It seems a strange thing to have, but this is the velocity, the equivalent velocity that the gamma ray has been Doppler shifted by millimeters per second. Very small change in energy, but the energy states of the nucleus are very sensitive to the state of the iron as a whole. And you can see when you send out the gamma rays at zero velocity, uh, some of them are emitted and reabsorbed. There's a big peak when you send them out at slightly negative velocity, slightly less peak over here, and then a series of peaks out through here. What are these peaks due to? Well, every single mineral with iron in it will have peaks in different locations. And these peaks here, 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 and here are due to a mineral called gerosite. And you can see that they look just like the peaks that are seen in the Mossbauer spectrograph. The Mossbauer spectrograph is an incredibly sensitive device for finding these things out. There's also a little bit of a peak over here. HM, you might guess, is hematite. And a little bit of hematite is seen here. This was not looking at a region with blueberries in particular, so there's some hematite just scattered throughout. But let's look carefully at what gerasite is. Gerasite has a complicated chemical formula. It looks like this. Here's the iron. We knew there was iron in there. And sulfur, sulfate in particular, is a main component. And then there's also either potassium or sodium or H3O or anything else with a plus one sitting in front of it. Attached to all this is some hydroxide. And in fact, notice that there's H's in here. Those H's in things like gerasite very well might be the presence of that hydrogen that was detected by the initial neutron spectrometer. The key thing about gerasite really is the sulfate. Gerasite forms in an acidic, sulfur-rich environment. In fact, the places you find gerasite on the Earth these days is in mine waste, highly acidic water seeping out of mines with sulfur-rich regions around them um, turn into these gerasite-like minerals. And in fact, one that's often used as a analog for a Martian environment is the Rio Tinto in Spain, which Tinto, uh, red. You can see why it's called the Red River here. It's, a, it's so much iron in the river that the whole I river runs red. You can see, you see essentially rust throughout the bed of the river. This is heavy mining region, highly acidic environment. Meridiani Planum may have looked something like this, maybe not quite the flowing river, but the general environment like this might well have been what it was like at the time when all these features were being formed. One other incredibly important thing that was discovered from the, the chemistry of the rocks was that this lower unit was made out of the same sulfur-rich material that the middle unit was made out of, which is the same sulfur-rich material that the upper unit is made out of. These sulfates, these, these iron sulfates, these gerasites, these are, these are salts. These are the sorts of things that you get in a, a playa, a, a shallow lake that evaporates, leaving behind the, the salts if you have sulfur-rich water. We know that that happened up through here, but it happened throughout. The interesting implication is that these dunes, well, we think about this dune period as a dry period where it's making dunes. Yes, it's a dry period in this precise spot, but the dune material is evaporitic material. It is the stuff coming off of a playa that might be right next door, might be 100 kilometers away, but it's a locally dry region at a place where there are wet playas either at the same time or previously. So the overall interpretation of this region of Meridiana Planum is not that we are looking necessarily at a dry period, a middle period, and a wet period um, with water going up and down between, but we're perhaps looking at spatially variable regions. We're looking at something that might form dunes in some places and there'll be some slightly lower spots that form damp regions 
between the dunes and even lower spots that form very wet regions between the dunes. As the dunes move around, as the water table moves around, these different regions can become dune-like, can become interdune-like, and we're seeing something like that in this. What do we now know? We now know that this region, at least, had water intermittently throughout it, throughout the column, sometimes at the surface, and that it had a very sulfuric composition, much like that Rio Tinto that we saw at Spain. It's a great story. I think that the, uh, the sending the Mars rover to this one spot and putting together this geological history, this one spot, is an incredible contribution to understanding the overall history at Mars. And it leads directly to the current day of sending an even bigger rover, looking even in more detail at a different spot, and we will talk about the geological history there in a few more lectures.